Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it has this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and all your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. So as we've been going through the book of Daniel, um, I've been discussing the fact that for me, anyways, looking through it, studying it, I see the impact of Daniel, um, primarily of his God, but then of his very life, and then his writings. And we said that as we got to the, the final half of Daniel's writings, uh, the book of Daniel, we would see the impact of his writing. And so three weeks ago, we began looking at the prophetic portion of, of this book. And last week specifically, um, we looked at, oh, 
so that's, skip that one for a second. Anyways, so we went to, into Daniel 8, and we talked about what was exciting about Daniel chapter 8. And I know it went really long last week, and I'm sorry for that. There's no way to split that one up. Um, we saw a prophecy that has already been fulfilled, that has been historically documented, recorded, and to be able to read just even a portion, and maybe I should have just told you what it said rather than reading all the, the, the writings from Maccabees, but, but I, I just wanted you to get the feel of, of the impact of that and what it must have been like to live in the days of fulfilled prophecy. These individuals, and again, later in, the, in, in Maccabees, as they're writing, they even refer to, and I think maybe in the one portion I read, they even refer to um, Mishael and Hananiah and Azariah and going through the fire. They talk about Daniel and how he went through the lion's den. And so these individuals had read the book of Daniel. They knew the prophecy, but they didn't know how the prophecy would be fulfilled. But there they were, living in that day, and they begin to see what? Well, this is exactly what Daniel talked about in This is the Little Horn, Antiochus Epiphanes. And so we saw then how through Antiochus, um, the little horn of, of Daniel 8, how the word of God was fulfilled in detail. And when we get to the chapter 10 and 11, specifically 11, um, and then into 12, specifically 11 though, the, the, the phenomenal detail that God is going to give through Daniel regarding the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And we just talked about just Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, and what was going on during that time. But God is going to give us great detail about Philip and, and these others that, that reigned during the time. And it was just amazing, that again, that he was giving it a couple hundred years before it ever occurred. Today, though, we're going to transition into the beginning cha- part of chapter 9. And what's exciting about this to me, I mean, this is probably, I know I have a lot of exciting portions of scripture that I just love, okay? So you're probably saying, oh, I got another one. But this is just like an incredible passage to me because we are reading about a prophet who's reading, or who is writing about reading what? The writings of another prophet. In beginning to understand that he what? Is living in the days of, of its fulfillment. That's what's really kind of cool. So he has read the law of Moses. We'll, we'll get to there in a little bit. He has read the writing of Jeremiah, which we're going to get to a little bit later on. Okay, so I know it's in the beginning of the portion, but we're going to come back to it because he refers to the rebelling against the prophet and stuff. And we'll come back to it then. But Jeremiah specifically was used by God to write about the 70 years, okay, which we'll come back to. And so Daniel is reading all these things. He's pondering it. I believe he's praying about it. Just as we saw in the last two times that he was full of despair and despondency as he's seeing and he's he's getting his visions and he's trying to understand it. And so as he's reading the prophecies of Jeremiah and stuff, which is very exciting, because remember, Jeremiah is living at the same time as Daniel. He's died before Daniel has died, but he's a contemporary. Jeremiah was a prophet in Jerusalem during the time of the exile. Ezekiel was a prophet in Bab- Babylon during the time of the exile. So Jeremiah and Ezekiel and some of the other minor prophets are, are contemporaries of Daniel. And so Daniel is reading the writings, the scrolls, which is, uh, again, I'm going to go a little step further on it, which means that it had to have already been understood as being what? Scripture, understood. And it has to be being copied in order for Daniel to be, be able to read it, to be able to read a scroll of it. I mean, he doesn't have the writing of Jeremiah, probably, right? We know that actually the writings of Jeremiah that Baruch made were what? Destroyed in a fire by the king, right? And God said what? Well, let's write another copy. And then he even added more, okay? And so this is just very profound stuff. So even by the time of Daniel, do you get it? There's an understanding, not of just the writings of Moses, but the writings of the prophets. Even in that moment, it was understood that this was of Yahweh, that Yahweh had spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet. So this is kind of cool. So, but the question that I have, and what's really important to me in, in all this, then, is, is not just that part. That's very important. But the effect that all that had 
upon Daniel. He wasn't just reading it as a student, which he was. He was a student of God's word. But he didn't just read it and add it to the, 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 the volumes of knowledge of Daniel. Make sense? But reading God's word had a profound effect upon his life. And as he prayed through, read about, pondered, asked God's understanding of, and then understood that he was living in that day of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah, it drove him to what? Prayer. It drove him to confession and intercession. And so I want to begin and look at this purely through the eyes of Daniel as he's praying, okay? And so we'll come back again to that prophecy of Jeremiah in a moment. But the first thing we see is this confession of Daniel of the rebellion, of the rebellious obedience, a disobedience of Israel, right? So he says, um, in, in that, the very first part of that, though, is the recognition of the sovereignty of God, right? Verse 4, I prayed to Yahweh my God and made confession and said, O Lord, Adonai, great and awesome God, who what? Who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. The first thing he does is he, is, I think of the, the, um, the, the teaching of Jesus. Lord, teach us to what? To pray. Where does he start? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He starts by the recognition of who God is. Does that make sense? This is exactly where Daniel starts. A recognition of who God is. He is the great and awesome God. He is the one who blesses those who are obedient. And as we're going to see, he's also the one who spanks those who are disobedient. He's the one who is the judge. He's not just the creator. He's not just the one who, who breathes the breath of life into us, but he's also the one who we will stand before. And as we saw in Sunday school, right? He's the judge of the living and the, the dead. Everyone, the, the dead, small and great, we're told in, in Revelation 20, are going to stand before him. There's no, bat, no pass. And Daniel gets it. He understands it. He doesn't have a pass. As a prophet, he doesn't have a pass. Think that one through. If there's anybody in the Bible, and I'll give you maybe three or four people you can throw out there, right? Who would you say got a pass? Joseph, Daniel, say, Paul. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's, just, there's certain people who just think, oh, they got a pass. Oh, they, got a, and they don't get a pass. They don't get a pass. Enoch and Elijah, they didn't get a pass. They're still going to be judged. And they're going to come back. I think they're the two witnesses. They're going to die. I don't think they escaped the, the portal of death. And so, but the point is that they even stood before the what? The judge. Even Job, the most righteous man, knew that he was going to what? Stand before the judge. And then he did while he was in his flesh. Could you imagine that one, huh? I mean, he's saying, you know, I know that after I die and my flesh is destroyed, I will see him. And God said, I'm, I got something new for you, baby. I'm going to let you see me now. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Job had a blessing. <laughs> he got to see it before he died. Make sense? Don't play the game thinking that, that God's the, the, the grandpa in the sky who's winking. Even Daniel understood Daniel, this righteous man, knew that God was the great and awesome God. He was the one who was going to judge the living and the dead, right? So he keeps his covenant. He's faithful in his, um, in his mercy with those who love him, with those who keep his commandments. But the other side is the recognition of the sin of man, right? We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Do you want me to sing this? We have done wickedly. Anyways, and rebelled, right? Even by what? What's the first part? How have they done wickedly and rebelled? By departing from your precepts and your judgments. 
we have rebelled against your commands. But then he doesn't stop there. Verse 6, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who have spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. God, you loved us so much. You are so faithful that you continually sent to us prophets. Again, we'll come to those prophets in a moment, okay? You continually sent these guys to us to warn us, to teach us, to, to, to call us to repentance. And we did nothing but reject their messages. In fact, we read about them in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and and prophets who were being killed. We read about in Hebrews chapter 11, prophets who were sawn in asunder. Something that was Isaiah. And you think about some of the profound things that Isaiah was able to write, Isaiah 53, about the the suffering servant, Jesus, who was going to come. And to think of that guy who was used by God to proclaim such things as being stuffed in a log and then cut in half. Yeah, that's pretty, like, not so good, is it? And Daniel's realizing, I've lived in that day. I've been living in the day when we have been killing your prophets. When you have been sending them over and over and over again to us to call us to repentance. And we've done nothing but reject them. You've given us your word. I mean, this is exciting. We think about it. We know because he's reading it. He's read it. And he's going to talk in just a moment about how how he's read the law of Moses. He's in exile. And he's still reading what? The Pentateuch, the law of Moses. He's writing the, he's reading the writings. This is exciting stuff to me. It was in existence. And he's reading it. And he's going to quote it. He's going to refer to it because he understood it. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us this day. Jesus said to lead us into what? All truth. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer for us that he would desire for us to be sanctified by his truth. And then he said what? Your word is truth. To whom much is given, much will be required. Do you get it? You are without excuse. Every man on the face of this earth is without excuse. Even the Iznag people are getting it in their language, aren't they? Praise God for your dad. I think of that. God is, I mean, is like a modern, you know, miracle guy. You know, God sent this, this humble teacher into the jungles because there's a group of people that need his word. And now a guy's devoted his life to putting God's word into the language of this simple. How many, how many, uh, in southern is neck, right? Or is he northern is neck? Southern. southern. How, how many are in that, that village, in that group? 400 or less. 400 or less. But God wants them to have his word. Still a lot of people. I get it. But from the perspective of billions, there's not a whole lot of people. Can you imagine spending your entire life, well, not your entire life, but your adulthood life, translating God's word? Years. Years. First learning the language, then making a dictionary, yes? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you got you to learn the language, then you got to make a dictionary so the people understood what the words are, right? And then translating the Bible so that they would understand it. 400 people or less. That's how much God loves you. I'm not lifting up um, Jonathan Bamford, which I rejoice in the Lord for him, but God sent him. He's God's servant. God loves the Iznak people so much <laughs> that he sent the man. And his wife. And every time I I look at Carrie, I think of that. This is the love of God. Do you get it? How much does this, this, does this book mean to you? Do you realize he, he took 40 men over the course of 1600 years in three continents So you would have this. And we just treat it like, just take it for granted. In so many years, I had a copy of it. Yeah, I was righteous. I would have one of those big ones, you know, that you put on your, on your uh, coffee table. I mean, I didn't have one of those teeny weeny ones that people carry around. A little sword put in your pocket, have only half the Bible, and then even less than that. I had the whole thing. 
It was there for anybody to open up that wanted to. Other than me. <laughs> because what? I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I had my living Bible, which a couple of times God tried to get a hold of me in my life. And I can give you my living Bible. I still have it. And it has some verses that are highlighted. At different times, twice in my life, I can tell you that God tried to get a hold of me. And I started reading his word. And that was a fad for a while. And then it what? And went away. Until God broke me and showed me my utter decadence. My wickedness. My iniquity. And that I stood condemned before him. And if I died at that very moment, I was going to hell. And I cried, I got if you can save this wicked soul, I'm yours. In August, I mean, I know I didn't say it right, guys. I know I was supposed to say, I state your name, do solemnly swear, I'm a sinner, and da-da-da. I know there's, I mean, there's probably a sinner's prayer that I was supposed to say. And I don't, that's a Catholic thing. Anyways, no, God just wants the what? The broken and contrite heart. And from that moment, he placed into me a desire to know him and to read his word. It's nothing special about me, and it's nothing special about you. It's something special about God. It's God who puts us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Again, it is his good pleasure for us to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's contained here. This is God's will for your life, is to spend time in his word. Not five minutes a day, but time in his word. Don't give him a tip. He doesn't need a tip. He wants your life. That's why he's given this to us. And Daniel is studying it, and he's reading it. And, it's, and the Holy Spirit, I believe, I mean, still working, even in the lives of people back then. No, he may not have been dwelling Daniel, but he's at work. It's always been his job to convict the world of righteousness, judgment, and sin. And that he's, he's there, and he's working through his word, God's word. And, and, and it works the work. Daniel's now convicted of what? Sin. And he doesn't start praying about the sins of them. That's what we like to do. The sins of the liberals. It's them Democrats. And I'm sorry, I apologize if you're a Democrat. But that's what conservatives want to do. And Democrats want to do what? Confess the sins of the conservatives, the Republicans, and the fact that they're working against the, 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 the ecosystem and they're destroying God's, God's earth. Say what you want. That's all within, quote-unquote, churchdom. You get it? And we want to confess everybody else's sin, but Daniel doesn't confess everybody else's sins. He confesses our sins. We have done this. And I appreciate it, Chuck, you emphasizing that as you, as you did the reading. We have sinned. Not they have sinned. I can't believe my people. I am here as a result of Manasseh bringing the idols into the temple. He didn't say that. Do you, do you note that he's never prayed that? The whole book, as we've talked about that, Daniel has never moaned and bemoaned where he's at and that it's the fault of everybody else. But now as he's reading it, he says, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. Even by departing from your precepts, we Daniel? How did Daniel do that? I don't know. But the greater, the more you know God, Peter said, his last words, right? But grow in the what? Grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen, right? How do you grow in grace? How much did you get when you got saved? How much, Tammy? All of it? Are you sure? How can you grow in it if you got it all? Because the more you grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the more you understand of his holiness, the more you understand of his love, the more you understand of his faithfulness, the more you understand you're such a worm. And Steve, I appreciated you (laughs) that when we were in Sunday school, we were talking about the the credit column. Even my righteousness, where I think is my righteousness, it's it's, it's negative because it's self-righteousness. It's like a filthy rag to God. No matter what you think you've done, that's good. Compared to the standard of God, 
we all fall what? Short. We. So I don't know what Daniel did. I don't know what goes on in his brain. There's probably times when Daniel was thinking wrong thoughts. There's probably times when Daniel wanted a little bit of power, when Daniel was struggling with pride. There's probably times when Daniel did all these things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They're very common to man. There's no temptations overtaking you, but what? Such is as common to man. Daniel was a man. He wasn't God. And he recognized that he was a part of it. I want to keep moving. But I want to make sure that this part doesn't get lost. His confession of his... Israel's rebellious disobedience, but then of God's righteous judgment. He goes on then and says, um, verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those near and those far off, in all the countries to which you have driven them. How did, they, how did they get put into those other lands? Physically, literally. How did they go to those lands? They were carried off as captives by other nations. Specifically, he's there because he was carried off by Babylon. But Daniel recognizes that it's the righteous judgment of God that he poured out upon them. He is the one who has driven them out because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us is shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To you, to the Lord our God, belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh our God, to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his word, which he spoken against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before Yahweh our God, that they might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, Yahweh has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For Yahweh our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. He begins and ends with the righteousness of God. God is righteous in his judgment. When he judges man, he will be found righteous. Again, as we talk about Sunday school, that judgment, there are the the books, the annals of everything that has been done by man. And you and every other person on the face of the earth are recorded in those books. I think I got a couple volumes to myself. And they're not good things. I'm going to be found what? Guilty. 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 I'm going to be worthy of condemnation. Worthy of condemnation. Worthy of condemnation. But then there's the other book. Praise God. Called the Lamb's Book of Life. And those who are found written in it will not be thrown into that lake of fire. And it's only because of what Jesus has done for me. But God will be righteous in his judgment. And that's what Daniel understands, even in the judgment upon Israel, which he is walking through at that moment. Listen, the days are coming. We talked about this last week, and we'll talk about it in the the weeks ahead. You and I may have the privilege. Wow, that's a weird word, isn't it? The privilege of walking through some of the precursors or even the beginnings of what we read about in Revelation. Could be already there. Not making any statements. But think about that. As you read about the seals being opened up, it doesn't sound very pretty, does it? And by the fifth seal, we read about 
the, those who are being beheaded for the, for the testimony of Christ. It's an honor. We don't see it as that. But Daniel understood, just as the Hasmoneans understood, the Maccabeans, that they were still to serve the Lord in the midst of it. And so as Mattathias declared to his sons and declared to the, the, the Roman um, governor, we won't go against the word of our God in the name of our God. We will stand. And so here's Daniel. He understands who he is. And so he then goes back to this declaration of Moses. You can turn if you want. I'm going to read quickly through Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 to 29. And then we're going to look at his word to Jeremiah, and that's in Jeremiah 25. Okay, they're on your sermon note sheet. I'm not going to do the one from Leviticus. You can read through that yourself. But in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 to 29, think about this. This is, this is Moses writing on the east side of the Jordan River before the Israelites go into the promised land. Okay? So they've just come out of Egypt. They've spent 40 years in the wilderness. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. Moses doesn't get to go in because he struck the rock the second time when God only told him to speak to the rock, right? So he's not going to be able to go in. He's allowed to go up the mountain. He's allowed to see it, and that's it, and he's going to die. So the book of Deuteronomy, you think I spoke long last week? Okay? The book of Deuteronomy is, is, is Moses preaching to the people. Okay? So, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 to 29 says, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of Yahweh your God, which he made for you, and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which Yahweh your God has forbidden you. For Yahweh your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you beget children and grandchildren have grown old in the land and act corruptly, when you have, not if you have, note his words, when you have. When you've had children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of Yahweh your God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will know you will not prolong your days in it, but you will be utterly destroyed. And Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yahweh will, what? Drive you. What did Daniel say? Where you have driven us. Verse 28, And there you will serve gods, the works of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But from there, from there, you will not... I hope you do. You will seek Yahweh your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Daniel's living it. Daniel's living this at this moment. They've been driven into the lands, and there they're they're worshiping what? The works of men's hands, right? We saw that with Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Right? They put it up and they're told to worship it. And someone made a comment, and I never thought about it before, until after I preached the message, someone made a comment. There were probably other Jews who were bowing down at that moment. I mean, I focus on Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they didn't, right? They, st- they stood, but that means there's probably other Jews who were bowing down. They're fulfilling this. But from there, From there, you will seek my face. From there, you will. Why? Because God will always have a remnant. God will always have a remnant. The mercy of God is everlasting. It is new every morning. If you've blown it, what do you need to do? Confess. Confess. 1 John 1, verses 8 to 10. Again, it's, I love the, the spiritual Oreo, right? If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. In you. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you say you have not sinned, you make God a liar, and his word is not in you. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Confess it, and God will make you right. Not because you are right, but because he's right. And he can do it.
than Jeremiah. Because um, we know the Daniel. So there could be other passages that he's read. But we know from this passage what? He's read Jeremiah and he's read the law of Moses, right? So that's why I'm only focusing on these two, okay? So Jeremiah 25, verse 1 to 12. Then the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the thirteenth year of Josiah, so get, get this, from the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, even to this day, this is the twenty-third year year in which the word of Yahweh has come to me. <laughs> Do you get this? I've been a prophet for 23 years. And I've been proclaiming this message for 23 years. I want you to sink in for a moment. He didn't mention it once. And I missed it. He didn't mention it twice. You know, if God says something once, it's what? It's important. If he says it twice, it's really important. If he says it three times, right? He really wants you to get it. He sent this guy for 23 years straight, and we're only talking about Jeremiah. We're not talking about all the other prophets who they were killing. But he watched over Jeremiah. Remember, they threw Jeremiah in the pit because they wanted to kill Jeremiah, but God worked it out so that um, he, he wasn't killed. He says, this is from the 13th year, so this is the 23rd year, which Yahweh has come, the word of Yahweh has come to me, and I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And Yahweh has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Repent! Now every one of his evil way and of his evil doings and dwell in the land that Yahweh has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says Yahweh, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to, to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says Yahweh. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and, and against these nations all around, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride at the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass, when 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says Yahweh. And I will make it a perpetual desolation. And then elsewhere we read that um, God would then send the people back to the land. And I go and talk about um, Cyrus, who I think that Daniel was the one who told Cyrus about the prophecy about Cyrus in the book of Isaiah. Just exciting stuff. Exciting stuff. Daniel is reading this stuff, and he's cut to the quick. God is righteous in his judgment. And he has lived it out now for the last almost 70 years. Could you imagine reading it and realizing you know what? I've been here for 68, 69 years. I can't tell you exactly how, what year this is, okay? I understand it's the first year of Darius. You can go back to David's message and, and, and hear the, the whole history of that. But it's just an amazing thing that here he is, and he's doing what? He's pondering it. This is getting ready to happen. I think it's probably the end of the 70 years when, when Cyrus, in the book of Ezra, tells him to go back and rebuild the temple. And if you read the last verse of Daniel chapter 1, you'll find out that Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus. Because God, God kept him there so he could tell Cyrus about the prophecies. 
And he allowed him to read the prophecies and understand the prophecies. So what does he do as a result? He makes intercession. The fervency of this prayer, as we see right from the very beginning, right? It says that, verse 3, Then I set my face toward Yahweh, to the Lord, Lord God, to make request by what? Prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. This wasn't just a little uh, prayer before your meal. This wasn't a little bit of prayer before you go to bed at night. Fasting, sackcloth, and ashes was a reminder of who they were in the presence of God. They were nothing but dust. God had taken the dust of the earth and out of it he had formed man. And so they were told then to put on affliction um, when they came before God in, in, in sorrow to afflict themselves, understanding that this honestly is the result of what I have done. This is just a little bit of what I deserve. So on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the man who would not afflict himself was to be separated from the peoples. To understand the consequence of your sin, that it is an abomination in, in in the eyes of God. It is a stench in his nostrils. And so Daniel, the righteous man, the man of prayer, he reads this. He understands it. And he begins to fast. Fasting is when when you don't eat or drink. Well, eating specifically, okay? And I want to make sure that we talk, because we have this coming up in a couple, in a, two weeks, three weeks, a week of prayer and fasting. Fasting specific is when you give something up. Of, as an affliction to your soul, okay? That as a means of, of going before God, as a, a way of reminding you, okay? Classically, it is then going without food. Not necessarily without water, but we're told in the Bible sometimes that like with Moses and Jesus, that they, they fasted without food and water, okay? Not recommended, okay? Okay? And many times in the Bible, fasting was only during the daytime, okay? So that it was kind of like, think Ramadan from the... the Islamic perspective, okay? That meant they, they probably had a snack in the evening, but they fasted. They didn't eat the rest of the day, okay? Um, except for when we're told then. They fasted so many days and nights, which t- tells us what? They didn't eat at all, period, okay? So as you look forward to the our week coming up, I'm not saying you got to do any of that at all, but it's something that you need to ask the Lord, what would he have you to do? What is the affliction of soul for you at that moment, okay? And it may not be nothing, okay? It may be that you're just going to give up breakfast. It may be that you're just going to give up lunch. It may be whatever, okay? And it sounds Lentish, okay? But that's actually the, the where Lent actually began, okay? I don't have a problem with Lent from that perspective. There was a, a, a days, 40 days of Lent was a reminder of Jesus in the, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness, okay? And how he fasted for 40 days, okay? And so there's a, an affliction of the soul that people would have going into then the, the Passion Week of remembering what Jesus has done for us, okay? So when you understand where historically things have come from, it, it helps you out, because we see them as what now? J- just vain, uh, vainless or vain traditions right now, okay? And so I don't have a problem with those things, okay? Um, when, 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 when you look at those and what they are. But there's a point then where regardless of whether it is once a year type thing or, or twice a year type thing, and, and Lord willing, ours is only a matter of a teaching, Okay, it's we don't want you only to be praying and fasting twice a year, once in the springtime and once in the fall. Okay, it's a it's a it's a teaching moment. It's to bring to our awareness that this is something that God would have us to do as a as a part of our lifestyle that we see here very clearly um, in the life of Daniel. He's convicted by the sins of his people and by his own, and it drives him to fasting, and in putting on sackcloth, and in throwing ashes on top of himself. A reminder of who he is before God. God is the one who breathed the breath of life into him. God is the one who what? Can snuff it right back out. So the fervency of his intercession. But what's the focus of his intercession? First of all, he prays for God's anger to be turned aside. That's a good thing, isn't it? Because he's recognizing that God in this moment has a righteous anger to his people. And he's asking God in his mercy, which is the second part, 
in his mercy to take away the anger. Do you understand that when you are delivered, there's two sides of that coin? It's not just he extends his grace to you. But as he extends his grace to you, he removes his anger. It's a righteous anger. The people in the world don't understand it right now. But they are under the righteous anger of God. And again, his judgment is just and right. If somebody continually rebelled against you, would you be angry? If you made them in your image and likeness, and they refused to listen when you called to them, would you be angry? Again, we mentioned the Sunday school. Be angry and what? Sin not. Not too many of us can do that. God can. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Even though he's angered with them, he still sent his son to die for us. (laughs) What a God! What an awesome God we serve. A great and awesome God. That's what I love about the memory verses I picked. You are a great and awesome God. You are faithful. In the midst of all, we have done sinfully. We have committed iniquity. We have done uh, uh, iniquity. We have done wickedly. He's righteous in his judgment. But in his faithfulness, he draws us back to himself. And from that land, you will seek my face. So, how saddened are you? by the state of our nation. David is looking over the state of his nation. And he's seeing a nation that's full of wickedness, a full of iniquity. What do you see when you look at our land? I see a nation that's under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God. A nation that has deceived itself, even believers, to thinking that we're still a blessed land. You ought to be full of remorse when you see what's going on in our land today. Daniel, it drove him to fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. What about you? What about me? We need to be praying in earnest for President Biden. Vice President Harris. Yeah, I get it. They're leaders of our land who are living in sin that need to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. How do you pray for Vladimir Putin? Do you pray for his redemption? What about the troops, Russian troops, and the, and the Ukrainian troops? Do you realize that all those people that are dying are going to hell if they don't know Jesus as their Savior? Does it fill you with remorse when you look at our world today? Do you want the glory of God to really be revealed? Or do you want just a little bit more of the American dream? What does your prayer life then look like? What place does confession and repentance play in your relationship with the Father? Does it bother you when you sin? That's when I knew I was saved. Before I was saved, it didn't bother me when I sinned. It bothered me when I got caught. Now it bothers me when I offend my father. How affected are you by the word of God? It's assuming for a moment there that you're what? No, you're reading it. You're not affected by it if you're not reading it. It doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I, you know, I read, you know, whatever, you know. But the word of God is given to us to make an impact. I believe that everything, everything, I really honestly believe this, everything he's written was written with Bob in mind. I know it's very self-focused, but you can put your own name in there. And I believe that every part of this book applies to my life in some manner. The other day, I mean, I was, I was just so focused on frankincense. 
Did you realize? I mean, he, he, this is a little aside. He made the priests sprinkle frankincense on the bread, and then he made them eat it. Isn't that weird? Did you ever stu- did you ever research frankincense? You should eat it. You should use it. It's really good. Oh yeah, you studied the properties of frankincense. This was amazing to me. It's good for for arthritis. For, for it's a, it's anti-inflammatory. There's all these. I don't want to get into it all, but I mean, it, there's potential that it's even an anti-cancer. Yeah, I'm thinking put incense on their bread and making them eat it like yuck. I mean, God. I mean, uh, uh, the affliction of the little soul. No, God was a loving God. Do you get it? the Book of Leviticus is not about laws; it's about love. Yeah, well, it's true. Well, what he had to cook it over. And so, but God is a loving God, and he put these things out there for us. It's so cool when you begin to read it and want to understand why did he give it to me. He's got a purpose for it. So then, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's, it's, it's so rich, and it's quick, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, you have given us your word in order for us to learn truth. And as I read of this occasion of Daniel, having read your word, and the impact it made on his life, I again am undone in my laziness, my slothfulness, my presumptuousness before you. Lord, help us, help me, but help us as your people to be diligent, to be desirous of your truth, of your word. Lord, that we would seek your face, we would hunger and thirst for your righteousness. We would seek your kingdom and your righteousness. We would press toward the mark for the prize of the high call to God in Christ Jesus, that we would want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Lord, change us. Revive us again, O Lord. Search us out. See if there be any wicked way in us. O Lord, help us not to focus on the sins of others, but on that which is within us. And Lord, that we would have a desire continually to be conformed to your image and your likeness, that you might use us in this world, Lord, We know revival ultimately comes from you. We ask for that. I ask for that. Lord, I ask for a revival in this land. I ask for a revival in my life. I ask for a revival in this community. Lord, and I know that that's going to come through your working, through your word, and the people responding in prayer. And so if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves, Lord, I know that they will then call out to you. They will turn from their wicked ways and you will hear, you've promised it. And I ask for it in Christ's name, amen.